Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together on this Sabbath, which is the, oh, I don't want to get that wrong. It's the 25th of the first month. Tomorrow is first fruits. We also have the, the ninth of the fourth month on the Gregorian calendar. And we are continuing with our reading and study of the recognitions of Clement. We're currently on book six, chapter one which is titled Diligence in Study. It says, but as soon as day began to advance the dawn upon the retiring darkness, Kepha having gone into the garden to pray and returning from there and coming to us by way of excuse for awaking and coming to us at a, later, a little later than usual, said this, now that springtime has lengthened the day, of course the night is shorter. If therefore one desires to occupy some portion of the night in study, he must not keep the same hours for waking at all seasons, but should spend some length or the same length of time in sleeping, whether the night be longer or shorter. And be exceedingly careful that he do not cut off from the period that he habitually keeps for study, and so add to his sleep and lessen his time of keeping awake. And this also is to be observed, or else if sleep be interrupted, while the food is still undigested, the undigested mass lead the mind by and by the exhalation of crude spirits render the inner sense confused and disturbed. It is right, therefore, that that part also be cherished with sufficient rest. Sorry about that. To continue, it says, it is right, therefore, that that part also be cherished with sufficient rest so that those things being sufficiently accomplished that are due to it the body may be able in other things to render due service to the mind when he had said this as very many had already assembled in the accustomed place of the garden to hear him kepha went forth and having saluted the crowds in his usual manner, began to speak as follows. Since indeed, as land neglected by the cultivator necessarily produces thorns and thistles, so your sense by long neglect has produced a plentiful crop of noxious opinions of things and dogmas of false science. There is need now of much care in cultivating the field of your mind, that the word of truth, which is the true and diligent, diligent husbandman of the heart, may cultivate it with continual instructions. It is therefore your part to render obedience to it and to lop off superfluous occupations and anxieties, lest a noxious growth choke Least a noxious growth choke the good seed of the word. For it may be that a short and earnest diligence may repair a long time's neglect. For the time of everyone's life is uncertain, and therefore we must hasten to deliverance, apprehending that sudden death might seize upon him who delays. And all the more eagerly we must, or sorry, and all the more eagerly must we strive on this account, that while there is time, the collected vices of evil custom may be cut off. And this you will not be able to do otherwise than by being angry with yourselves and on account or on account of your profitless and base doings. 
for this is righteous and necessary anger by which everyone All right, so sorry about the being kicked so many times. I'm willing that won't be happening anymore. This is, we're going to back up a little. It says, and this you will not be able to do otherwise than by being angry with yourselves on account of your profitless and base doings. For this is righteous and necessary anger by which everyone is indignant with himself and accuses himself for those things in which he has erred and done amiss. And by this indignation, a certain fire is kindled in us, which applied as it were. Sorry about that. To a barren field consumes and burns up the roots of vile pleasure and renders the soil of the heart more fertile for the good seed of the word of Yahuwah. And I think that you have sufficiently worthy causes of anger from which that most righteous fire may be kindled. If you consider into what errors the evil of ignorance has drawn you and has caused you to fall and rush headlong into sin, from what tobe things it has withdrawn you, and into what evils it has driven you, and what is of more importance than all the rest, how it has made you liable to ageless punishments in the world to come. Is not the fire of the most righteous indignation kindled within you for all these things? now that the light of truth has shone upon you. And does not the flame of that anger that is pleasing to Elohim rise within you, that every sprout may be burnt up and destroyed from the root, if any shoot of evil concupiscence has budded within you, the evil desire or intentions of the, of the mind? Hence also he who has sent us when he had come and had seen that all the world had fallen into immorality, did not forthwith give shalom to him who is in error, lest he should confirm him in evil, but set the knowledge of truth in opposition to the ruins of ignorance of it, that if men All right, top of the page here, it says, Hence also, he who has sent us when he had come and had seen that all the world had fallen into immorality, did not forthwith give shalom to him who is in error, lest he should confirm him in evil, but set the knowledge of truth in opposition to the ruins of ignorance of it, that if men would repent and look upon the light of truth, they might rightly grieve that they all have been deceived and drawn away into the precipices of error and might kindle the fire of salutary anger or salutary anger against the ignorance that had deceived them. On this account, therefore, he said, I have come to send fire on the earth and how I wish that it were kindled. There is therefore a certain fight which is to be fought by us in this life for the word of truth and knowledge necessarily separates men from error and ignorance. As we have often seen putrefied and dead flesh in the body separated by the cutting knife from its connection with the living members. Now, this fight that he mentions, he says, therefore, there's a certain fight which has to be fought by us in this life that directly ties into the second 
work in creation, the letter bet, which is the earth. After the fall of man, he was given the earth to work until the ground with the sweat of his brow, with thorns and thistles coming up, and to patiently endure in these things, combating to righteousness in working what he's given to do, or in working the covenant, if you will, which ties in with the literal letter bet, bet yo tau. Um, that second work, what he was given on earth, is the place for which we are to combat to righteousness in, in doing that, in working the covenant. So it ties in exactly with what he's saying here. And that's something that you can see from the parable of creation all the way back in Genesis, Yobelim, and the very letters of the Aleph Bet and what they mean. But to get back on track, it says, such is the effect produced by knowledge of the truth. For it is necessary that for the sake of deliverance, the son, for example, who has received the word of truth, be separated from his unbelieving parents. Or again, that the father be separated from his son or the daughter from her mother. And in this manner, the battle of knowledge and ignorance <clears throat> of truth and error arises between believing and unbelieving kinsmen and relations. And therefore, he who has sent us said again, I am not come to send shalom on earth, but a sword. And if you recall, throughout the Renewed Covenant writings, he, he mentions there's going to be division and fighting, not, not shalom, but a sword. And if you look at the original covenant writings, the actual Torah instructions, you're supposed to love your near kin, to do good and benefit your relations and not to, to forsake them, to love your neighbor from your heart and to reprove them for these, the things that they're doing in error. So that kind of mentality was never put away. And as you're about to read, it's the very thing that you're doing in love that, that causes the division and separation. But it's not from real believers. It's from the other party. Because the adversary abhors the light and flees from it. How the fight begins. <clears throat> Yet if anyone say... How does it seem right for men to be separated from their parents? I will tell you how. Because if they remained with them in error, they would do no good to them. And they would themselves perish with them. It is therefore right and very right that he who will be delivered be separated from him who will not. But observe this also that this separation does not come from those who comprehend a right, for they desire to be with their relatives and to do them tobe or good and to teach them better things. But it is the vice peculiar to ignorance that it will not bear to have near it the light of truth, which confutes it. And therefore, that separation originates with them. For those who for those who receive the knowledge of the truth, because it is full of goodness, desire, if it be possible, to share it with all, as given by Yahuwah. Yea even with those who hate and persecute them, for they know that ignorance is the cause of their sin. So in short, the master himself, when he was being led to the stake by those who knew him not, prayed to the father for his murderers and said, Father, forgive their sin, for they know not what they do. The Talmudim are taught ones also in imitation of their master. Even when they were suffering, in like manner prayed for their murderers. But if we are taught to pray even for our murderers and persecutors, how ought we not to bear the persecutions of parents and relations and to pray for their conversion? Then let us consider carefully 
in the next place what reason we have for loving our parents for this cause it is said we love them because they seem to be the authors of our life But our parents are not authors of our life or existence, but, mean, it's, but the means of it. For they do not bestow life, but afford the means of our entering into this life. While the one and sole author of life is Yahuwah. And again, if you don't know, the literal meaning of Yahuwah is he who causes it to be. There's other nuances for his, like he who exists, he who makes it present test. There's a lot more definition to it. But he who causes it to be is the author of all life because he causes it, he wills it into existence. If therefore we would love the author of our life, let us know that it is he that is to be loved. But then it is said, we cannot know him, but them we know and hold in affection. Be it so, you cannot know what Elohim is, but you can very easily know what Elohim is not. For how can any man fail to know that wood or stone or brass or other such matter is not Elohim? But if you will not give your mind to consider the things that you might easily apprehend, it is certain that you are hindered in the knowledge of Elohim, not by impossibility, but by indolence. For if you had desired it, even from these useless images, you might have been set on the way of comprehension. For it is certain that these images are made with iron tools but iron is wrought by fire which is extinguished by water but water is moved by ruach and ruach has its beginning from yahuwah for thus says the foreteller moshe in the beginning elohim made the firmament and the earth or the shamayim and the earth but the earth was invisible and unarranged and darkness was over the deep, and the Ruach of Elohim was upon the waters. Which Ruach, like the Creator's hand, by command of Elohim, separated light from darkness? And oh, just a moment. And after that, invisible sky produced this visible one. Or after that, invisible Shemaim produced this visible one. That he might make the higher places of habitation for Melakim and the lower for men. Now, if you notice that he puts that plural, there's places in the firmament above. And it was always plural to begin with. He made Shemaim. In Irenaeus is against heresies, in the ascension of Yeshayahu, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls and places like the Psalms of the Sabbath sacrifices and other things of that nature, it mentions there, there's up to seven firmaments, including this visible one. So six others beside the one that you can see. And those are the habitations of the messengers. So it says, for your sake, therefore, by command of Elohim, the water that was upon the face of the earth withdrew, and or that the earth might produce fruits for you. And into the earth also he inserted, inserted veins of moisture, that 
fountains and rivers might flow forth from it for you. For your sake, it was commanded to bring forth living creatures and all things that could serve for your use and pleasure. Is it not for you that the winds blow, that the earth conceiving by them may bring forth fruits? Is it not for you that the showers fall and the seasons change? Is it not for you that the sun rises and sets and the moon undergoes her changes? For you, the sea offers its service that all things may be subject to you, ungrateful as you are. For all these things, will there not be a righteous punishment of vengeance? Because beyond all else, you are ignorant of the bestower of all these things, whom you ought to acknowledge and reverence above all. But now I lead you to comprehend by the same paths, for you see that all things are produced from waters. But water was made at first by the only begotten, and the almighty Elohim is the head of the only begotten, by whom we come to the Father in such order as we have stated above. And it's written as stated above, but that's not what he said when he was preaching, right? He would have said, as I just mentioned, the reason why it's said as stated above is because Clement was writing what was going on. Just some people might use this and get caught up in it. There's reasons for why that's happening, and it's explained earlier in the book. But when you have come to the Father, you will learn that this is his will, that you be born anew by means of waters, which were first created. For he who is regenerated by water, having filled up the measure of good works, is made heir of him by whom he has been regenerated in incorruption. So, with prepared minds, approach as sons to a father, that your sins may be washed away, and it may be proven before Elohim that ignorance was their sole cause. For if after the learning of these things, you remain in unbelief, the cause of your destruction will be imputed to yourselves and not to ignorance. And do you suppose that you can have expectation towards Elohim, even if you cultivate all obedience and all righteousness, but do not receive mikvah or immersion? Yea, rather he will be worthy of greater punishment, who does good works not well. For merit occurs to men from good works, but only if they be done as Elohim commands. Now Elohim has ordered everyone who worships him to be sealed by immersion. But if you refuse and obey your own will rather than Yahuwah's, you are doubtless contrary and hostile to his will. But maybe you will say, what does the immersion in water contribute towards the worship of Elohim? In the first place, because that which has pleased Elohim is fulfilled. In the second place, because when you are regenerated and born again of water and of Elohim, the frailty of your former birth, which you have through men, is cut off. And so at length you will be able to obtain deliverance but otherwise it is impossible. For thus has the foreteller of truth testified to us with an oath, Amen, I say to you, that unless a man is born again of water and of the Ruach, he will not enter into the Malkuth. says, Therefore, make haste, for there is in these waters a certain power of mercy that was born upon them at the beginning, and acknowledges those who are immersed under the name of the Master Yahushua. Later on in the book, he, he says you're immersed in the name of Yahuwah Yahushua, 
which is also what's throughout the book of Acts, that believers were immersed in the name of Yahuwah Yahushua, which is the full name of our Mashiach. He was given the Father's name, and he came in the name Yahushua. So he was called by both after he was risen. And he was even called Yahuwah before he was risen. In the book of Luke, when he was born, the messengers, when singing his praises and announcing the glad tidings, said to the shepherds that today in the city of Dawid was born unto you Mashiach Yahuwah. So um, that is literally all over the place. And it's something that you can find if you look at what's called the Nomen Dakra which has the placeholders that were used for the Greek manuscripts instead of the, the wrong names and titles that wouldn't, that aren't true. But moving on, it says, Yahushua and rescues them from future punishments. Just a moment. I'm going to have to mute you. All right, sorry about that. Yahushua and rescues them from future punishments, presenting as a gift to Elohim the spirits that are set apart by immersion. Commit yourselves, therefore, to these waters, for they alone can quench the violence of the future fire. And he who delays to approach to them, it is evident that the idol of unbelief remains in him. And by it, he is prevented from hastening to the waters that confer deliverance. For whether you be righteous or unrighteous, mikvah or immersion is necessary for you in every respect. For the righteous, that perfection may be accomplished in him, and he may be born again to Elohim. For the unrighteous, that pardon may be guaranteed him for the sins that he has committed in ignorance. Therefore, all should hasten to be born again to Elohim without delay, because the end of everyone's life is uncertain. But when you have been regenerated by the waters of immersion, you must show good works, or you must show by good works, the likeness in you of that father who has begotten you. Now that you know Yahuwah, honor him as a father, and his honor is that you live according to his will, and his will is that you so live as to know nothing of murder or adultery, to flee from hatred and covetedness, to put away anger, pride, and boasting, to abhor envy, and to count all such things entirely unsuitable to you there is truly a certain peculiar observance of our way of life which is not so much imposed upon men as it is sought out by every worshiper of elohim by reason of its purity by reason of chastity i say of which there are many kinds but first that everyone be careful that he come not near a menstruous woman for this the Torah of Elohim regards as detestable. But though the Torah had given no admonition concerning these things, should we willingly... Like I'm sorry to interrupt, but I gotta go. Oh, all right, Jeanette, you have... For we ought to have something more than the animals as reasonable men incapable of Shamayim senses, whose chief study it ought to be to guard the conscience from every defilement of the heart. And with that, we're going to go ahead and stop for today, or this Shabbat, and we will continue with chapter 11 next week, Ob willing. You all have a wonderful Shabbat, and we will see you next time. And also a, a Shavuot Tober, a Tob good week ahead. Thank you for your time.